Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we're gonna read the story of Mel. This story was submitted to Usenet 1983 by Ed Nether. Real programmers write in Fortran. Maybe they do now in this decadent era of light beer, hand calculators and user-friendly software. But back in the good old days, when the term software sounded funny and real computers were made out of drums and vacuum tubes, real programmers wrote in machine code. Not Fortran, not RAT4, not even assembly language. Machine code. Raw, unadorned, inescrutable, hexadecimal numbers directly. Lest a whole new generation of programmers grow up in ignorance of the glorious past, I feel the duty bound to describe as best I can through the generation gap how real program programmers wrote code. I'll call him Mel, because that was his name. I first met Mel when I went to work for Royal McBee Computer Corp a now defunct subsidiary of typer, typewriter company. The firm manufactured the LGP-30, a small, cheap drum memory computer, and had just started to manufacture the RPC-4000, a much improved, bigger, better, faster drum memory computer. Cores cost too much and weren't here to stay anyway. I had been hired to write a Fortran compiler for this new marvel and Mel was my guide to its wonders. Mel didn't approve of compilers. If a program can't rewrite its own code, he asked, what good is it? Mel had written, in hexadecimal, the most popular computer program the company owned. It ran on the LGP-30 and played blackjack with potential customers at computer shows. Its effect was always dramatic. The LGP-30 booth was packed every show and the IBM salesmen stood around talking to each other. Whether or not it actually sold computers was a question we never discussed. Mel's job was to rewrite the blackjack program for the RPC 4000. The new computer had a one plus one address scheme in which each machine instructions in addition to the operation code and the address of the needed operand had a second address that indicated where on the revolving drum the next instruction was located. In modern parlance, every single instruction was followed by a go-to. Put that in Pascal's pipe and smoke it. Mel loved the RPC 4000 because he could optimize the code. That is, locate instructions on the drum so that just one finished its job, the next would be just arriving at the read head and available for immediate execution. There was a program to do that job, an optimizing assembler, but Mel refused to use it. You never know where it's going to put things, he explained, so you'd have to use a separate constants. It was a long time before I understood that remark. Since Mel knew the numerical value of every operation code and assigned its own drum addresses, every instruction he wrote could also be considered a numerical constant. He could pick up an earlier add instruction, say, and multiply by it 
if it had the right numerical value. His code was not easy for someone else to modify. I compared Mel's hand-optimized programs with the same code massaged by the optimizing assembler program and Mel's was always faster. That was because the top-down method of a program design hadn't been invented yet and Mel wouldn't have used it anyway. He wrote the innermost parts of his program loops first so that they would get first choice of the optimum address locations on the drum. The optimizing assembler wasn't smart enough to do it that way. Mel never wrote time delay loops either. Even when the bulky flexo writer required a delay between output characters to work right, he just located instructions on the drum so each successive one was just past the read head when it was needed. The drum had to execute another complete revolution to find the next instruction. He coined an unforgettable term for his procedure. Although optimum is an absolute term, like unique, it became common verbal practice to make it relative. Not quite optimum or less optimum or not very optimum, Mel called the maximum time delay locations the most pessimum. After he finished the blackjack program and got it to run, even the initializer was optimized, he said proudly. He got a change request from the sales department. The program used an elegant optimized random generator to shuffle the cards and deal from the deck. And some of the salesmen felt it was too fair, since sometimes the customer lost. They wanted Mel to modify the program so that at a setting of a sense switch on the console they could change the odds and let the customer win. Mel barked. He felt that was patently dishonest, in which it was, and that it impinged on his personal integrity as a programmer, which it did. So he refused to do it. The head salesman talked to Mel, as did the big boss, and at the big boss urging, a few fellow programmers. Mel finally gave in and wrote the code, but he got the test backwards. And when the send switch was turned on, the program could, would cheat, winning every time. Mel was delighted by this. Claiming his subconscious was uncontrollably ethical and adamantly refused to fix it. After Mel had left the company for greener pastures, the big boss asked me to look at the code and see if I could find the test and reverse it. Somewhat reluctantly, I agreed to look. Tracking Mel's code was a real adventure. I often felt that programming is an art form whose real value can only be appreciated by another versed in the same arcane art. There are lovely gems and brilliant cups hidden from human view and admiration, sometimes forever, by the very nature of the process. You can learn a lot about an individual by just reading through his code, even in hexadecimal. Mel was, I think, an unsung genius. Perhaps the greatest shock came when I found an innocent loop that had no tests in it. No tests. None. Common sense said it had to be a closed loop where the program would cycle forever endlessly. Program control passed right through it, however, and safely out on the other side. It took me two weeks to figure out how. The RPC 4000 computer had a real modern facility called an index register. 
It allowed the program to write a program loop that it used an indexed instruction inside. Each time through, the number in indexed register was added to the address of that instruction, so it would refer to the next datum in a series. He had only to increment the index register each time though. Mel never used it. Instead, he would pull the instructions in a machine register and add one to its address and store it back. He would then execute and modify instructions right from the reg register and the loop was written so its additional execution time was taken into account. Just as its instructions finished, the next one was right under the drum read head, ready to go, but the loop had no tests in it. The vital clue came when I noticed the indexed register bit, the bit that lay between the addresses, and the operation code in the instruction word was turned on. Yet Mel never used the indexed register, leaving it zero all the time. When the light went on, it nearly blinded me. He had located the data he was working on near the top of the memory. The largest locations of the instructions could address so that the last datum was handled, incremented, the instruction address would make it overflow, and the carry would add one to the operation code, changing it to the next one in the instruction set. A jump instruction. Sure enough, the next program instruction was in the address location zero, and the program went happily on its way. I haven't kept in touch with Mel, so I don't know if he ever gave in to the flood of change that was washed over programming techniques since those long gone days. I like to think he didn't. In any event, I was impressed enough that I quit looking for the offending test, telling the big boss I couldn't find it. He didn't seem surprised. When I left the company, the blackjack program would still cheat if you turned on the right sense switch. And I think that's how it should be. I didn't feel comfortable hacking up the code of a real programmer. So I hope that you liked this little story. Leave a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you have any comments, leave them in the comment section down below. I read all of them. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And I really hope to see you in the next video.